Okay, good morning, everyone. I hope you had a great weekend. Uh, today we continue our discussion over antic, uh, predictive analytics. Uh, we learn uh, the uh, basic con con contents behind of it and what is the application and how we use it. The next classes, we also have some hands-on experiences with the free NIME software that if you might remember in your early classes, in one of them, I explain how to download and install it. Please have it installed. And uh, so for the next class, uh, you would be prepared. Uh, so by the way, is there any questions from the previous classes? Are we gonna go over the homework and the quiz? Uh, not today, but later we go. Okay. Okay, so if there is no questions, so let me go over the PowerPoint. Okay, so by the way, the homework three is due 24th of March. You also, you might already see that you have a homework four and I'm going to post homework five later, either in this week or in next week. Also in March 29th, you have a second quiz, which is covering chapter three, four, and five. Oh, sorry, weeks three, four, five. So we are in week four right now. So you have one more week and then you have the quiz. Also keep in mind, yeah, you have a project delivery that's the two days coming up soon. Okay, what we, uh, we will cover this week. We start uh, learning about uh, predictive analytics. We go over some applications, some pro standard processes like CRISTM, CMA, KDD. Uh, so as extra re uh, introductory reading, I uh, talk a little about decision trees, but I put some optional reading for you to study by yourself because uh, decision tree is not a part of this course, but it might be helpful for you to get a, a, some general dot, uh, knowledge about uh, decision trees. And also we get uh, getting started with uh, nine. So again, please have it installed for the next class so we can go over it and uh, see if, uh, uh, what can we do with this software. But basically most of your predictive analytics is over nine. If you already have knowledge of using Python and R, you can use those too, but nine is a, uh, is for everyone. So I, uh, because we have the, uh, based on your first assignment and your introduction, I understand that you have, you are from different backgrounds. So nine is for all of you, but if you uh, you are much more comfortable with other tools, you can use them. So first of all, let me ask you a general question. Is technology and artificial intelligence such as IBM Watson? So is IBM Watson just an artificial intelligence platform uh, offered by IBM? Anyway, is technology and artificial intelligence such as IBM Watson affecting the number of uh, antics jobs? So do you think if we have more artificial intelligence and if this technology gets more advanced, do you think you lose job or you, uh, you might have more jobs? I would say that it's harder to say one way or the other, because on one hand, there's going to be a less analyst sitting doing like regressions and stuff like that. But on the other hand, you're going to need more people coding the AI and managing the AI and like making that itself better. But that's also more of a computer science thing than I guess than what we're really doing. Yeah, actually, this is a, a really tough question because so many things comes in my in your mind. So yeah, basic jobs might be done with uh, those artificial artificial intelligence tools, but there are all other advanced uh, technologies. I mean, that need more people. On top of that, you know, like for airplane, they don't need pilot. They, they artificial intelligence enough for uh, basically. Uh, just flying the, an airplane, but nobody trusts that. So, uh, so although even airplanes, they don't need uh, pilots for landing uh, an airplane or flying an airplane, uh, 
they need a human to just observe it. So uh, pilots used to have a very difficult job. Right now, their job is much easier because of artificial intelligence, but nobody replaced them. So for some uh, critical jobs, such as pilots or maybe surgeons, uh, at least in the near future, uh, they don't lose their jobs because it's very critical and we need a human surveillance over the artificial intelligence. But yes, some basic jobs might be vanished. Okay, let's look at this video. Okay, just before that. Um, let me see, I think I should make this. Can you hear the, could you hear the uh, video's uh, voice? No, no. Okay, so let me see. Let me just stop sharing then uh, again. Uh, okay. okay, that's option it used to be very easy to find, but there's an option that let me share my uh, computer's uh, voice with you. Um, let me see. Yeah, unfortunately, I can't find it. Let me just see one more time. Otherwise, I'll let you to say. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I cannot find it right now. Anyway. Um, okay, I found it. Sorry. I remember that morning going to the lab and I was thinking, this is it. This is the last Jeopardy game. This is Jeopardy, the IBM challenge. Here we go. Brad, if you're ready, make your first choice. Let's take alternate meanings for 200, Alex. Four letter word for event. So just let me give you an explanation. Jeopardy is a, like a TV game. People go and ask about their general knowledge. So IBM created Watson as the artificial intelligence uh, platform. So now you see a video that IBM Watson is competing with actual people. So in the center, there's uh, IBM Watson. And also you see two other guys competing with IBM Watson. Vantage point a belief. Brad, what is a view? Yes. After the first clue of the game, which Brad won, I had just this horrible feeling at that moment that he was as good as everyone said he was, and he was just going to run the whole board on us. Watson, what is you? You are right. We actually took the lead. We were ahead of them, but then we started getting some questions wrong. Watson, what is leg? No, I'm sorry. I can't accept that. What is 1920s? No. What is cheek? No, sorry. Brad. What is class? Class, you got it. Watson. What is Sauron? Sauron is right. Oh. And that puts you into a tie for the lead with Brad. The double jeopardy round of the first game, I thought was phenomenal. Watson went on a terror. Watson. Who is Franz Liszt? You are right. What is violin? Good. Who is the church lady? Yes. <laughs> Watson. What is narcolepsy? You are right, and with that, you move to $36,681. The risk was, Ken gets a daily double, bets big, 
gets it right, he's going to be well ahead. And then with that kind of lead going to Final Jeopardy, if he bets enough, he could end up winning the match. Ken, what's a committee? We got to find that last daily double. We got to find that last daily double. It was a crucial moment in the game. There was still a daily double on the board, and it was starting to become uh, pretty clear that it was in the legal ease category. Let's go to legal ease for 1,200. Watson. What is executor? Right. Same category, 1,600. Answer, daily double. That was the moment when I knew it's over. The category is 19th century novelists. What Watson wants to do then is preserve the lead, not take a big risk, especially with Final Jeopardy, because just like for humans, Final Jeopardy is hard for Watson. Now we come to Watson, who is Bram Stoker and the wager. Hello, 17,973, and a two-day total of 77,147. I would have thought that technology like this was years away, but it's here now. I have the bruised ego to prove it. My past Jeopardy experiences have been great, but they weren't really weighty with this kind of technological, philosophical importance. I think we saw something important today. Didn't really think very much about the implications until later and say, wow, wait a second, this is history. Of course, this whole project is not ultimately about playing Jeopardy. It's about doing research and deep analytics and a natural language understanding. This is about taking the technology and applying it to solve problems people really care about. We're just so excited about all the things we can do with this. I had thought this is the end. We get there, we're done. And I'm realizing it's just the beginning. Okay, uh, I hope you, you have amazed. amazed. Uh, actually, uh, at the end of this course, we also uh, learned uh, something similar to that, how to use a uh, text document as a natural language uh, and the techniques natural language processing. So you process it, some text to predict some outcomes. And this is the basic uh, methodology behind the uh, IBM Watson. Okay, but let's talk about two major things. Uh, data scientists and analytics translator or uh, somebody who use analytics. So basically in this, uh, there is some similarity between these two. So both of them have some hands-on experiences, both of them use data and also use some techniques to uh, do some predictions or find some correlation between some input and outputs. And, but data scientists or data analysts, which somehow you are in the left side, especially if your major is the data uh, analytics. So on top of that, they need some uh, other knowledge of like uh, base, uh, some uh, data management uh, knowledge like database or big data infrastructure how to handle those data. And also uh, in the like PhD level, this lends some of mathematics behind of that. Versus analysis translator, the people who worked with the data analytics, analysts and also data scientists, they also can uh, do uh, wonderful jobs. Uh, they can take the data, use uh, machine learning algorithm or artificial intelligence algorithm, I get some uh, basically uh, interesting out, uh, outputs from them. Uh, they use those outcomes basically to solve business problem or it like um, for, uh, improving some situation. Depends on your uh, future. If you are more in analysis or data science part, you mostly on the left side, so you need to spend more on technical part. Uh, versus, if in future you are not that uh, you are not a data scientist or uh, analyst, analyst, so you probably you need to learn how to use those uh, basically uh, predictions or how to use those analytics. Uh, basically, you need to learn how to uh, work with the data scientists and use those knowledge to solve your business challenges.
So let's say, talk about data mining. Basically, uh, there is no biblical definition. Usually when we talk about data mining is kind of uh, synonymous of saying that machine learning or artificial intelligence. So people might use or use same definition for all of them, but you, you can also find some slight differences. Basically, um, we use data mining or machine learning or artificial intelligence to find some patterns from your data. Like the, uh, which in, in, input variables lead to an output and or what are the association between inputs and outputs? How you can basically uh, categorize your observations into different classes? Or maybe in the time series prediction, like uh, you might remember in Tableau part, we look at the sales per month or per year. So you already saw a pattern, but uh, how we can use that pattern to predict something in future. So these are these uh, patterns are generally association, prediction, cluster segmentation, or sequential or time series relationship. There are some techniques like linear regression, logistic neural network, or deep learning, which is a more complex uh, uh, type of neural network, and so so on and so forth. Uh, in this course, you don't need to know mathematics behind those techniques or algorithms or models. Basically, you need uh, same as uh, a translator. You need to know how to use them, how to interpret the outcomes, and uh, basically how to solve uh, your business issue using those techniques. But later you learn that using these techniques is not difficult. So you can, at the end of this course, you can easily use um, any of them that makes sense for your data and get insightful predictions or outcomes from your models. Any questions so far? Okay, let me talk about supervised versus unsupervised learning. Um, when we are talking about supervised learning, we, we try to predict a, a variable or a label. For example, what is the stock? Uh, let's say we want to predict stock price movement from movement means is it increase or decrease in comparison with the previous day. So the label is either increase or decrease, or it could be a continuous variable. What, like, what is the stock price value today? So you try to predict a dependent variable. So these kind of uh, analytics are under supervised learning versus in unsupervised learning, we are not trying to predict a dependent variable or a label, a label. Basically, we try to uh, categorize observation in the similar groups based on their similarities. Like, look at this figure on the uh, bottom right. So we have three clusters or three groups of red, green, and blue. They are categorized in the different colors based on distance similarity. For example, the uh, blue circles are close to each other and under the blue uh, cluster because they are much closer. Same for green and same for red. Okay, let's look at the uh, ta taxonomy of uh, data mining. Okay. We have uh, basically uh, three general subgroups. First is predictions like classification. I talk about price movement. Or in the Titanic uh, assignment, uh, one class could be survive, one class could be die because the passenger either survive, survived the Titanic crash or they couldn't. So 
we have two classes. Regression is like a stock price, and time series is like uh, sale in the, I mean, if you might remember you had uh, a class, class experiences in hands-on experience that we had in the last two weeks. In one of them, you look at the pattern of uh, sale per month, and uh, using that pattern uh, or time series, uh, you can predict what happens in future. Another type is association, like market basket analysis, link analysis, and sequence analysis. Uh, like which one of the good examples is when you go to supermarkets, some items close each other, like coffee and coffee filters or sugar, uh, because there is association between a mathematical association between a coffee filter, coffee, and sugar. So where people use it for their breakfast or just to drink a coffee. Uh, having said that, some of them are very intuitive, but we can use some models to show it to us. And some of them may not be very intuitive. We talk about more interesting example later. The last part is uh, basic segmentation that I said, we group observations into similar categories based on their similarities. And uh, no worries, I mean, later uh, we talk about more uh, interesting examples. In last three weeks, we, uh, we did some visualization experiments and people generally consider it as a data mining task because using visualization, you can find some patterns or some uh, issues or some challenges in your data. For example, in the banking uh, example, so we look at the uh, bank accounts in the United Kingdom. So you might look at, uh, you can visualize uh, account, average account balance, and you might see some differences in some, uh, in some parts of the United Kingdom. So you got it through visualizations. And you can use analytics to find the reason why some uh, regions of UK, we have more bank, uh, uh, like people in, invest more in their bank accounts or their balance is higher versus in some places is lower. So uh, this kind of investigation is through anal analytics or data mining algorithms. So keep in mind, uh, visualization help you to find the issues or some labels uh, or some business challenges, then we use analytics uh, to answer them. So if it's first time you're facing data mining algorithms, you might say, what is the difference between statistics? Basically, you might remember you had regression, you try to predict something, or uh, even um, in logistic regression, you can basically do uh, classification. You can look, because regression is looking at the two different categories, like yes or no, zero and one, and you try to predict them. Uh, what these are very really, uh, basic, examples like statistics actually has some advantages over the general data mining algorithms. Using statistics, you can find the reasons of uh, uh, correlations, or you can easily provide a mathematical proof for, for such a predictions, but you cannot do in most of data mining algorithms. In data mining, we don't focus on interpreted, interpreting uh, the relationship between variables and providing the mathematical proof. We just look at the outcomes. Uh, having said that, um, in some cases, we are not that much interested in uh, finding the relationship. Outcomes is much more important. Also, 
statistics are limited to uh, mostly normal distributions. So we expect our data for normal distributions uh, or we can convert them to a kind of normal uh, distribution characteristics. Uh, however, we don't have that limitation in most of data mining uh, algorithms. For example, if you want to do image processing, so image is not a, like a normal distribution or text mining, so it's text, not numbers. Or you might have very complex relationship between your variables that first of all, they don't follow a normal distribution and relationship is not linear. So having said that, I mean, most recently uh, people, uh, people consider statistics under umbrella of data mining. And basically we have two types of data mining models. One of them are white box, like a statistics. So in white box algorithms or a statistical algorithms, basically you can find relationship between uh, variables. You can interpret your model's internal uh, process. Versus in the black box algorithm, uh, algorithms, you cannot find a mathematical reasoning for your outcomes or interpreting the internal of your model. Uh, but those black box models are really helpful because in many cases we are focusing on the outcome and predicting uh, like some important uh, labels. So we use them. Okay, for implementing the data mining processes, like as I said, first part maybe is visual, even visualization, understanding your problem, your business, finding the issues, and later preparing your data for those models that either white box or black box models. There is some general processes. It's kind of similar, uh, but, uh, these are just general standards. I mean, you, if you already had some data mining project, probably follow one of them even without knowing the names. But uh, you, it's very good to, to uh, in, in your research to talk about which standard you follow. I mostly recommend the first one is more intuitive, but the others are very similar. So this, I posted to, uh, uh different standard processes. First one is CRISTM, cross-industry uh, standard process for data mining, SEMA, sample, explorer, modify, model, and assess. And KD, not knowledge discovery in database. Let's talk about CRISTM. First one, business understanding. For example, uh, you might uh, uh, work in the or do analytics in uh, banking. So you need to know some banking terms or you're working in the healthcare. You need to know those terms. For example, what does blood type means? What the, how, how to interpret blood pressure? Then you need to understand your data. So visualization usually goes in the second part. So you can do visualize your data, see the patterns and see the issues that you want to look at. Then uh, next part is data preparation. So there might be some typos in your data or there is some unrelevant data that you want to exclude. Or uh, later I talk about more part of it, but basically in data preparation, you make your data ready for model building. And in, up to now, you usually spend 85% of your total project time. In model building, you, you simply just uh, input those data that you prepare it into model and you uh, then you evaluate your model in the, the test set and uh, you can understand how how you are doing well and uh, if you're satisfied with your result the last part is deployment like the banking uh, example that I just talked about for example uh, we, are, we understand age is the important variable in predicting uh, bank balance 
and you see that your bank balance is decreasing over time, maybe you can do more ads or advertisement for younger people to uh, just uh, get in your bank and uh, bring them in your bank to make more accounts. So maybe you can make more money. So basically in model building, uh, in model building, we want to see the, some association between the outcomes. Maybe later we want to use it for uh, marketing purposes. So in the deployment part, we want to do marketing, but we need to understand which variables are important and which groups we should target. So which in the modeling or, and testing part, you can easily understand. So look at uh, this figure about Christian. As you see, it's like a cycle. So it's not just uh, some stepwise processes. You might go back and forth. Let's say you do everything up to test and evaluation, which is the fifth stage, but you are not very satisfied with your model. Maybe your uh, per model performance is very low. So you need to go back Maybe instead of a neural network, maybe you need to use SVM model or regression model, or you need to get back to business understanding and data understanding. Maybe you miss some important valuables. Uh, if let's say you are in the healthcare industry, maybe you reach your medical doctors and saying that my uh, per model performance is low, what healthcare related variables you missed. So maybe they can give you some insights. So again, you go back and forth maybe several times until you get a very good uh, performance, let's say a model accuracy. And uh, after that, when you are very satisfied, uh, you can deploy your model. In, let's again, talk about healthcare example. Um, I want to uh, look at the survival of my patient after surgery. And uh, I want to predict if they can, uh, how long they survive after like a cancer related surgery. And maybe I understand some medicine are really related or blood pressure is very related. So you can reach the medical doctors and saying that I tested my model as accuracy is like 99%. and uh, on top of that, understood, if you prescribe this medicine, your patient lives more, or if you check their blood pressure and lower on certain levels, they, they survive much more. So you can help medical doctors to make a more informative decisions. Having said that, uh, as you see, maybe in the healthcare industry, Accuracy of this model is not that much important. Maybe finding correlation between input and outputs are more important because uh, you don't you, you that you don't that much care that somebody how long they survive, but you care how to prolong their survival. One could be prescribing some certain medicine. Versus, let's say you want to predict the stock price in the next day. For you. Uh, Finding the correlation with values may not be that much important for you is uh, having a very high accuracy in prediction is important because you're making business. You want to uh, very accurate in predicting the stock price. Any questions so far? Again, sorry, today might be a little boring, but we need to go over some co uh, concepts. and. And later we jump on um, hands-on experiences. As I said, either you're a, uh, you would be a data scientist or uh, analyst, analytics translator. In both cases, you should have hands-on experiences to be successful. Okay, let's look at other standards, SEMA. As you see, there's some similarities there's, uh, in general concepts. First of all, is the cycle. You might back back and forth. As you see, we have sampling, which uh, we get a representative of data. We explore, as you see, 
maybe through visualization, modify, it's mostly about data preparation, modeling, assess is just evaluating. And uh, we just back and forth until you have a maybe high accuracy. KDD, knowledge discovery in database. Again, as you see, it might be like a, it's like a uh, like triangle or a pyramid. But again, as you see, it has different steps, which uh, kind of similar meaning like data selection, which in uh, KSTM is like business understanding and data understanding. Then you have uh, data cleaning, which in KSTM is data preparation and data uh, then transform your model prediction and then you evaluate uh, to see and after, if you're satisfied with your evaluation you extract the pattern and basically provide the knowledge the knowledge could be as i say in healthcare finding the factors are associated to your patient's survival i listed different um, methods um, um, or standards uh, as you see after qstm my own means like you made your own standards or your own steps so you don't have to follow steps for your project maybe you, you uh, make your own steps or your own cycle that makes sense for your data but uh, qstm is more general and at the end all of them have almost same meaning I already talked about data preparation. As I said, is most of your time goes to data preparation. Uh, first of all, you need to have a good background about your data to have a better business understanding. Then in data preparation part, you basically consolidate your data from different sources, clean your data. Let's say in the healthcare, I'm trying to look at like patient survival after surgery and i'm looking at the adult patient but when i look at my table some of them are like some of my patients weight is less than 20 pounds doesn't make sense so it doesn't make sense that an adult has uh, the weight of 20 pounds so maybe there's a type of unit to just delete it or some data or pictures for example you look at um radiology uh, image uh, or so radiology image or you look at some text like watson watson look at the text and by using those texts try to predict uh, and use those predictions in the jeopardy game so one part is data transformation so you need to convert your uh pictures or text document to something that is makes sense for models you need to convert to numerical equivalent. Otherwise, you, your model cannot use picture or text to do predictions. The data transformation part is kind of challenging. So you need, there is some uh, standard methods how to convert a text document or pictures to a numerical equivalent. Then we can import those num numerical equivalent into models and do our predictions. One of the methods that uh, later you use for your fifth assignment is classification. Again, class in classification, we try to find label of a dependent variable. Like in, let's say in the Titanic example that you had an assignment, uh, you want to predict if somebody survive or die. So the label here is survive or die or uh, like, survival of your passenger is not a uh, uh, continuous variable it's not like a regression that you have in one side you have y and other side you have like a times x plus b so in such a case as we are talking about classification we, that classification could be two groups or more than two groups but uh, our dependent value is not in the numerical uh, shape and then uh, also you need to know about differences of clustering and uh, classification. 
in again in classification we have the label like uh, passengers survival in cluster you don't have label or we don't look at the label at all like um let's say you again let's let me tell you a marketing example so you let's say you want to promote some um new products in massachusetts um one way just doing one ad for everyone and see what happens so that but it could be more effective to target your uh, customers based on their similarities so for, for example i'm i'm not sure, sure how many of you from china or india if you just came to us you might see you get some ads in chinese or uh, like hindu so basically uh, or if you are from us and you go travel to uh, like egypt which they speak arabic or they go you go to uae they speak arabic or turkey they speak turkey but when you open your laptops your ads in youtube are in english they are not in turkish or arabic the reason uh, they have some algorithms to uh, find similarity of their customers here use youtube and to, to, based on the similarity they find some uh they just use different ads for different groups of people so here they are more effective for example if you go to um let's say turkey and they show you Turk, uh, Tur turkish ad they just waste their money uh, they cannot assume everybody in, inside turkey speak turkish so for some uh, proportion of like tourists they waste their money um, uh, or I, I I assume all of this is tenacious and they speak their own language when they come to US, but it's more cool to see some as in your own language. So as you see, um, in such a cases, they try to basically categorize their customers based on their similarities or um, Maybe the type of ads is different based on people's uh, characteristics, other characteristics. For example, if you do so many search about uh, buying sport or gym uh, equipment, um, or maybe you're shopping a lot, like uh, you, shop, you do Google about uh, some gyms or uh, searching for some trails, Maybe uh, it seems that you're a very healthy one. So they don't show you some uh, advertisement about diabetes. So it's, if so, if they, maybe they can assume this uh, based on uh, whatever they had so far, the people who do exercises, I mean, they look at the trails and they buy some gym products or search for gyms around their neighborhood. They're less likely uh, to have some diabetes. So, it's how they can do it. You can find some other examples in your own industry, but again, here you don't, you uh, try not to predict uh, people's label. You just try to uh, categorize them into certain groups based on their similarities. Okay, uh, let's talk about simple versus complex model. Look at these two groups of, look at this figure. I have two lines, one of them is green and the one is black. The green one could, uh, divide, could divide my uh, disc discs in two groups more accurately. So as you see, all of the blues are in one group, all of the greens are in the other groups. This is much more complex than the uh, black line. It's uh, as you see, some of the uh, blue discs are within uh, red ones, and some of reds are within blue. 
Having said that, you might, let's say this is a classification problem. And I use two different models, the green model and black model. Uh, black model misclassifies some of the disks, uh, but the green ones uh, could uh, perfectly uh, classify my disks into the groups without any mistake. So here you might say it's in the green model, which here represent by the green line is a better one. Uh, having said that, although the accuracy is better, but interestingly, we are not interested in the green ones. What ha happens later, based on your experience, you understand such a complex model are very good on certain databases or tables or observations that you train your model. But if you use them later, if you want to generalize your model in new data set or new dates or new observations, you cannot generalize it more. Versus the black model, which represents the black line, you, you can generalize better. And if you introduce new observations, they can easily classify two groups with more accuracy. So again, complex models might have a good uh, accuracy on certain data sets. But if you generalize them to the new data set, usually they, they are not performing well. So in new data sets, usually the black ones are better. It's the reason when we train the models that I talk about, we evolve a very complex model. The complex models are usually have too many variables. So we avoid having too many variables in our models. So look at this one. So the left one is underfitting is, uh, if it, and it's a, again, it's a different one. Like here we have regression problem. So in the regression on the left side, we have too many errors between the actual dots and the line. In the right side, we have a very complex regression line that it seems cover most of the dots. But again, if we cannot generalize it well for with the new data, versus in the middle one, we have the good one, it's, uh, the error is more than, uh, is it much less than underfitting one, but is help us to generalize more and we can use it later much better than the overfitting or underfitting cases. Any questions? I know it might be a little fuzzy, but when we go to, uh, hands-on experiences, these things make much more sense for you. But just uh, by now you can understand, we, we try to avoid very complex models because they are not applicable as simple ones. So later in new data sets, uh, your, perform, your accuracy is much less. For example, let's say I want to try a stock price and I have last 100 days data for training my model. If I used the simple one for tomorrow, my accuracy is better than the complex one. Because the complex one is overtrained with the previous data that I had. I cannot generalize it or use it later for new data because it's just fit, fitted best with my current data. Okay, we talk about uh, application or evaluation of the models. Basically, uh, usually you have a train and test set. Train, uh, but how you make them? Basically, you have a, a data set. You randomly divide your data into sections. One section is train and the section is test. You train your model, machine learning or data mining model over train set. So look at here, we have uh, one to N cases. We have a target or label. So also, you know, the dependent variable has different terms for that. So sometimes instead of dependent variable, we say target variable. So both of them are same. After training model on the left side, we use it in the, that independent data set 
So we see how we are accurate in predicting the dependent variable. So if you are, uh, if you have good accuracy in the test set, you would be very happy with our model because in train set, you might have high accuracy, but we are more interested in test set. Or in future, you can bring a new data set and reevaluate your data. But we, we call the new data set the valid, uh, uh, valid uh, I mean, validated test or validated uh, uh, database. Here is another figure talking about the complexity of model. The upper one, uh, er, er, prediction error for the new data set. So it could be validation data set or test set. Validation set or test set, the upper one. The lower one is train set. As you see, look at the left side. The differences between uh, train and test set or validation uh, set is very close. But if you look at the uh, prediction error, you have a high error. So if you have um, low number of observation, or low number of variables, or you have a very simple model, although the differences between train set and test set are very close, but you have a high error. You increase uh, number of observation or make more complex model. As you see, your error is going down for both test set and train set, but you get a more gap. Again, if you go to the right side, we have a more complex model. The prediction in the train set is going down. The error is going down, so it's good. But error in the test set is going up. And also the gap is increasing. So the optimum point is in the middle, which is we have enough complex model. It's not too complex. And uh, as you see here, we have the minimum test error. And again, for us, uh, the test uh, accuracy is much more important than uh, train accuracy because later we want app apply our model in for new data. So for us, having a high accuracy or low error in test set just means we have a better model. We don't care about our train set. So it's, this figure actually is the reason here. I said uh, we are more happy with the black model. Although in the train set, it has more error. But we know in the test set, we have the minimum error, which is good. Any questions so far? Hi, Professor. Uh, I have a question. Sure. Well, validating da uh, data is same as testing data. So your question is the train and test are same? Yeah, it's the uh, validating data and testing data, all of them. You know, unfortunately, there is not that much of general um, or biblical definition for that. But I'm uh, keep in mind, you, usually train set is an independent set that you train your model. You also have a test set, and vali uh, which sometimes they call it validation test or validating set. Uh, basically, is a new data set that you try to use the train model on it. So let me show you here. Look at here. So you, uh, in the left side, uh, you, you have the data that you, uh, you gather for your project, right? Mm. Yeah. So some portion is train set, some portion is test set, right? Yeah. So in train set, you train your model, you get to model development, and you use it to look at the accuracy on your test set. Uh -huh. On top yeah. of it, let me just show my... 
I can just oh sorry. Is that so? Also, maybe in future, you introduce new data, then you want to look at the performance of your model in the new validation test set. But sometimes, instead of validation set, they call the test as validation set. So no worries. You just keep in mind, uh, you, a part of your data, you use it for uh, training your model. We call it train, the train set. On top of it, we have a test set and validation set. Test set, you validate your model based on your current data. But validation set is usually the data you get it in future. Okay. Yeah, I got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Again, having this figure is the reason saying that why we are more happy with the uh, uh, red, sorry, with the uh, black line, because the black line is representative of a more simple model that you have less error for your new data. It, it could be tested or validation set. On top of accuracy, which sometimes we call it um, hit rate. So these are just equivalent. Uh, sometimes we look at the speed. So it depends. It's not usually, it, it's not that much relevant to you, but sometimes you have a very huge data sets. Um, in those big data cases, some models are much faster. For example, just as an example, logistic regression is very good, very, very, very has a very high speed with the big data uh, versus like neural network or SVM is very slow. On top of that, robustness. Uh, we want to see how we are confident in class labels. For example, um, let's say I have a Titanic uh, passenger data and I, I predict he or she survive. But sometimes I say I'm confident with 60%, sometimes I'm saying with the 90%. In both cases, I predicted that, that that passenger survived, but one time my confidence was 60%, another time 90%. It's also very good for trading decisions. Let's say you train a model and your mother would say, tomorrow, Apple stock price goes up. Then you check the robustness of your model. You, you, you see that uh, your mother said tomorrow with 60% chance it goes up. You may not trade that stock because for you 60% is low. Although it's saying it's going up, but it's not very robust. Versus, let's say, two days later, your mother say, uh, I'm 90% confident that stock price goes up. So in this case, your mother is much more confident. Other thing is scalability. So it's kind of in, uh, similar with the speed. So how your mother is good when you scale your data much more than... Uh, this small sample that you have. Like maybe one time you look at um, uh, Worcester, uh, Worcester area and try to do some like uh, market prediction versus you look at the United States. So is your model is enough scalable for such a case? And the more interpretability of your data, as I said, a statistical model has transparency and explainability. So 
you can easily explain what is going on in your statistical models, such as decision tree, uh, regression, even there are some mathematical proof behind them. Versus you have more black box model in data mining category, which you cannot explain why you get some outcomes versus in statistical models, you can explain why you got some outcomes. Okay, you have a reading assignment, which I posted on Moodle. I want you to just, you can easily Google it. It's very uh, easy uh, task. What are differences between black box and white box, uh, white box models? Provide some example for each. What I mean, examples, for example, I just said decision theory is a white box model. Maybe you find other white box models or you find some black box models. Just see, uh, tell me what are the differences and um, what are like each one, I provide some examples for each and tell me which one you think is better. Again, for you that you, um, just came to US, uh, you shouldn't just copy and paste from a website, you should rephrase it. And it's, it's a very bad uh, practice against the university code if you don't rephrase or you don't provide your references. You should be very professional in uh, this assignment because you are looking at the other resources. Also, I posted a, a YouTube video for you to understand decision theory which is an example of white box model. So in this video, you learn uh, how to interpret a decision tree model and how to, uh, you can see it's much, is really a transparent uh, model. So the second one is optional. You don't have to look at it, but in case you're interested and you already know our rattle program, it's very easy to follow the video, uh, but even if you don't know anything about decision tree, uh, it's okay if you never uh, work with R is okay. In this video, you can see the instructor can explain uh, what is under hood of the decision tree model. Okay, let's talk about uh, accuracy of, uh, classification models. This uh, table is for when you're, uh, Model just had two categories. Let's say in the Titanic example, if hasn't just survive or die, when your dependent variable has more than two categories, you cannot use this. Maybe you just can use accuracy. So accuracy is, uh, be, okay, before talking about the accuracy, so, Look at this figure on the left. Rows represent the, uh, how your model predicted, and columns just means um, the actual dependent variable. Uh, and I'm talking about 100 observations. Sorry, there's a typo here. So, as you see, in 50 out of 100, the predicted class, you predicted positive, and they are, they're actually positive too. Let's say, um, instead of positive, negative, let's talk about survive and die. So let's say in the Titanic case, for 50 passengers of 100, you predict they are survive, and also they truly survive. Same for negative, it's, let's say it's a negative talking about die. For 40 passengers, you predict they die. And also based on your data, they, are, they actually died. We also then look at the false positive count or FP. In the Titanic example, let's say six people, we predicted they survive but based on the data, they died. So we call it self, uh, sorry, false positive. 
again in Titanic case, uh, let's say um, we predicted four people died, but based on uh, our historical data, they survived. So they are falsely labeled as negative or die. And you see how we can predict accuracy. This accuracy means uh, under the, in the denominator, you have all the observations, either uh, true positive, false positive, true negative, and false negative. So here in the denominator, the summation is 100. In the numerator, we have what we actually what we are right in our prediction. So in 50 case, we predicted uh, true because they are actually positive and we predicted positive. Also in 40 cases, we predicted negative and they were actually negative, so 40. So if you calculate here, the actor is 90, 90 or uh, I'm 90 percent. Again, these positive and negatives, it just might depend on variable label. Um, look at the true positive rate. It just means what I uh, predicted as a positive. So some of the true positive, like here, But some of them are actually positive because let's say we, we are sure the label are positive, but you predict it as negative. So they are in the denominator. True negative rate. So uh, what we, uh, we look at the, what we predicted as negative and how we are good at this. So because some of them um, we predicted as uh, positive, but they're actually negative. And same for the others. So as a good practice, you can just uh, find other examples. So for Titanic case, maybe instead of positive, negative, negative, you just do positive, uh, instead of positive, consider survive, and instead of negative, consider as die. The goal of these uh, performance measures is just compare how you are good in predicting some outcomes. I just talked about different models like logistic regression, neural network, deep learning. These are all classification pro algorithms or they, are, they have some uh, classif classification versions. Uh, so let's say one time you use regression logistic regression, I mean, and your accuracy is 80%. Again, you use SVM, your accuracy is 85%, or you use deep learning and your accuracy is 90%. So these performance measures, these five performance measures just let you good uh, ruler to justify which models are better in your case. In your final project, you might show me that, Hamid, I used to, like two different models. In one of them, my accuracy is 90%, in the one 80%, in the one 70%. I picked it 90% because this model has the best tested uh, performance measure or have like, it could be have higher accuracy, higher precision, higher recall. Any questions so far? Okay. I think talk about this. Um, and uh, other perf uh, performance measures add under ROC curve or we uh, generally talking about AUC. It's for binary classification. It just means your dependent variable has two classes, like positive, negative, or it could be survive or die. Uh, the explanation of this performance measure is much more complex than these five that I just talked about. But uh, 
frankly speaking, if your ROC is closer to one, it just means you have a good model. Uh, if it's close to 0.5, it just means it just, it doesn't work well. If you just toss a coin, maybe it's better than uh, spending a lot of time to train a complex model. More specifically, AUC is talking about how you are good in predicting both classes. Maybe you, you have, sometimes you have a good model that you have a very high accuracy and true positive rate, but maybe your negative rate is low. So you, you may or may not be interested in that model, but sometimes you have a model that you have high accuracy, high true positive rate and high true negative rate. So instead of looking at these three, instead you can just look at ROC because ROC is kind of more uh, comprehensive performance measure. Instead of saying that I'm good at accuracy, I'm good at true positive, true negative precision recall, you can just simply say, I'm good, this is a really good model because I have a higher AUC. So having said that, this is actually a good performance measure. It just means you're very good in predicting both of the classes, both survival, both dead. Or you're very good at predicting um, positive and negative, all of them together, not just positive or not just negative. Looking at here, um, I download the data and then I randomly divide into two data sets. Like 30% went to test or validation. As you see, I put both of names here because if you look at your different references, sometimes uh, they use different terms. But anyway, and uh, I train my model in the train set and evaluate over test set. You might say doesn't mean it is you have a good model because maybe the random test set that you picked here is really a good set that you have a low amount of error or your accuracy is just randomly high. For showing that my model is not just uh, is is not picked based on just randomness and it's very generalized model and you can use it, you, you, you can confidently use it for future use. Instead of just saying, okay, one train, one set, uh, in cross validation, we make co uh, uh, basically uh, uh, K test sets and K train set. Look at the left side. So how many piece of, uh, look at this uh, disc, how many pieces I have? I divide it to how many pieces? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So it's divided into 10, uh, subsections. First, I just pick one of them. I, by the way, this uh, division into 10 sections, it just happened totally randomly. Anyway, I pick first 10%. I consider it as a test set here and the remaining 90% as train set. So what I do, I use the 90% to train a model and test it over this, uh, the remaining 10%. In the next round, I select the second 10% and consider it as a test set. I use the remaining 10% for training my model. And then I evaluate my model over the second 10%. And I do this train and test division 10 times. So what, what is the purpose of it? I just, instead of just one train, one set here, test set here, here I have 10 train and 10 
test sets. I just want to show you, look at my model is uh, performing very well. I, uh, I tried 10 times and seems, and then I showed the accuracy of my test set in all the folds or all sections. And sh then I can uh, be uh, bold about my model saying that instead of just dividing my data in one test and train, I divided 10 times and all of them, I have a high accuracy. Uh, it just seems I have a really good model. And I can use it for future use because I already tried 10 times and all of them I have a very high accuracy. And uh, it seems that uh, is a really good and stable model that I can use it for future use. So as you see here, I have 10 subsections. So here, instead of K, you can say 10. So I have 10 fold cross validation. Any questions? Uh, professor, I have a question. Sure. Uh, so in that figure, uh, you mentioned that after the data is pre-processed, uh, it will be divided into uh, train and test data. Uh -huh. uh, so it is not necessary that we pre-process it every time and then only uh, divide it into train and test, right? Because uh, the test data necessarily has to be something that is unseen totally. And we cannot uh, like uh, work on the missing values, uh, like missing value imputation uh, cannot be performed on the test data, right? Like on the data as a whole, right? Only after, so what I'm trying to say is only after dividing into train and test data, like we can perform uh, uh, the pre-processing on the train data and the test data separately. Uh, you know, th any information that you use in train set shouldn't be shared with your test set. Sometimes uh, you can do such a thing after division. Sometimes even you can do it before. Let's say um, I let's say I want to make a prediction for. Titanic passenger survival, right? In, let's say for some passengers, um, I don't have their uh, the city that they embark to the ship, right? Okay. So what can you do uh, here? Oh no, that's not a good thing. Let's me talk, let's talk about their age. So let's say I want to look at uh, passenger survival. I want to see which one survive, and I have the passenger age. For some passengers, I don't have their age. Maybe it's just missing, right? Yeah, right. Okay. So I, I cannot impute median. So instead of missing, I can just use the passenger median age or me, um, average of their age or me, age mean. So what if I want to do that, I'm using those things, which is, I mean, age median comes from all passengers. I cannot use it for test set. Maybe I divide is to train and test. And then just to median of age, I use it as an imputation method for train set. But generally speaking, those data preparation should do after division. Yeah, okay. So we take, we take the median of the train data. Yes. Yeah, okay, thank you. You're welcome. I think we are off the time. Um, just a little bit. Small section is remained. Um, the last of this PowerPoint is about decision tree. Since it's not a major part of the course, uh, please study by yourself and I already posted a video. And let's see just how many slides you made. Okay, so next class, I a little go over some basic concepts. Everything after, uh, from uh, decision to please study by yourself if you're interested. It's not again a part of this course. Also, I posted an assignment. Please uh, look at your assignment and it should be an easy assignment. You just need 
to Google about white box and black box model. And uh, then, uh, yeah, I think you have one week for that. So please prepare for the next class. So have your NIME installed. We have some hands-on experience using NIME and we go over some concepts that uh, I covered in this class. And hopefully by uh, making your hands dirty, it I mean, means dirty means good thing here. I'm dirty with the model. Uh, this concept makes a lot more sense for you. Okay, thank you very much and have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Professor.